We're continuing our series then called The Kingdom of God Then. And I want to just remind you of the context of this passage. Much of what we're sharing is a response of Jesus to the question of the disciples when the end of the age would be and what would be the sign of his coming. And in a nutshell, Jesus said, don't worry about the when. You don't know the when. Nobody knows the when except the Father. But what you need to know is the what. What is going to take place and what will the kingdom of God be like then? In Matthew chapter 13, we have seven parables that explain the nature of the kingdom of God now. But when Jesus comes back, what will the kingdom of God be like then? Well, it will be a time when he brings everything on this earth to a conclusion. And he sets up his kingdom and reigns over this world. You know, I believe that this is a message that needs to be preached more and more. The kingdom, the coming kingdom. When people are seeing this world falling apart at the seams and uh, running out of control on a self-destruction mission, we can be at rest and at peace because we know the plan. We know what God has in store. Jesus, the true king, is coming to set up his kingdom and he will reign over this earth. The earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And friends, at that time, God is going to position his saints in the kingdom to give them positions of responsibility and reigning. And this is what this parable is about, the parable of the faithful stewards. It's a parable about stewardship. And um, there are three words that I, that I want to share with you to, to try to help us to understand this whole subject of stewardship. And uh, let's have a look at this verse, first of all, that introduces this parable. For the kingdom of God is like a man traveling into a far country. Who is that man? Jesus. Thank you. Who is that? Well done. Good and faithful servant. Like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. His goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a, great, on, on, on a journey. So first of all, there are three words that we want to look at. The first word is ability. Ability is, is God, you know, grace is God's ability given to us. His ability in the place of our inability. What we can do when we're undergirded by the power of the Holy Spirit. What we are empowered to do because he has graced us with his ability. Amen? Now, friends, this is a very important subject because we saw in those verses that what the, the master delivered over to the servant was his goods. Everything in this world belongs to him. He is the creator of all things. In fact, one of the names of God is El Elyon possessor of heaven and earth. Everything in this earth has come from God and belongs to him. The psalmist says the earth is the Lord's and its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Now friends, that's an important statement. In fact, if, if people understood that, there would not be a problem in the Middle East today. Because you see, the land of Israel it's his land. And he gave it to the people of Israel for an everlasting possession. He can do what he wants with what is his. Amen? And when people leave God out of the equation, then we have wars. And that's just one example. But the Lord is the possessor of heaven and earth. In Psalm 52, I'm oh, sorry, 50, we read, If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the world is mine and all its fullness. So God is the creator. I've shared with you a, a story, of course it's a made up story, but it illustrates the point very well of when a group of scientists came before God and they said to God, we don't need you anymore because we can do what you can do. 
We can take some dirt and we can create a man. And God said, okay, go ahead. So one of the scientists bent down to pick up some dirt and God said, no, 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 you get your own dirt. (laughs) See, we can create things out of what has already been created, but God created everything out of nothing. It's his, amen? And he can do what he wants with what is his. And what he has done is he's entrusted to us what are his goods so that we can use them for the profit of his kingdom. Paul says this, what do you have that you did not receive? Amen? It's all come to us by his grace. And that's the character of stewardship. We don't own anything, but we possess many things. Actually, there's less pressure in managing what is someone else's than trying to own things yourself. We weren't created actually for ownership. We were created for stewardship. We were created to manage what is his. When you, whatever you try to own will end up owning you. Amen. You think about it. But we weren't created for that. And, and stewardship actually is our dignity. It's an incredible dignity that God has placed upon us. Out of every species that God created, he could have entrusted stewardship to any of those species. But he gave it to us. He gave the whole dominion of this world to us. The psalmist asked, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him? For you made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. What does it mean to be crowned with glory and honor? Well, glory is that we have the moral image of God. We saw that last week. Only we have been created with body, soul, and spirit so that we could be indwelt by God, so that God could live through us and manifest His glory, the glory of His moral image, that the world would see God shining forth through us. We saw that last week in the parable of the the virgins and their lamps. Amen? So what is honor? The honor that God bestowed upon us is this distinct privilege of having dominion over all his creation, having management of planet Earth. What an incredible honor, friends. Amen? We see that clearly in the next verse. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. And so we are stewards, and that's not like a servitude thing. It's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing. It's it's a a thing, you know, whereby we've been entrusted with great responsibility. I'm thinking of that verse that Paul uh, quoted when he said, um, God has regarded us um, as being faithful, having put us into the ministry. God has given us this trust because he trusts in us. He believes in us. Amen? And he wants to honor us with this great responsibility. And so we function as stewards. That's how we were created. When we try to function as owners, then it goes wrong. And that was, the, that was at the heart of the fall. Satan came along and he said, you're a steward. You're serving God. You could be God. You can break from God. And and you can come up higher. What happened? He went down lower. (laughs) He didn't go from being a steward to an owner. He went from going, going from being a steward to a slave. Now Satan is called the God of this world, the Lord of this world, the Prince of this world. And mankind, wittingly or unwittingly, is serving him. Paul spoke about... um, those that may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. And friends, this is a part of the mission of salvation. When Jesus came, it wasn't just to forgive us our sins and to bring us to heaven. It was to restore to us that status that Satan had taken from us. To restore that back. You know, the thing is this, that when, when, when we blew it at the fall, God could have given this planet to the angels. Amen? 
but he didn't. It was a part of his redemption plan is that this would be restored to us. Praise God. For he has not put the world to come in, of which we speak in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. He's not talking about back in creation. He's talking about it, it, the world to come. You read that at the, the first line there? The world to come. Speaking about futuristic now. And you have set over him, uh, him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see things, all things put under him. We do not see God's people managing and ruling and reigning over this planet. It's to come. Amen. But we see Jesus. We, we see Jesus who has conquered Satan. We see Jesus who is coming again. He's the coming king. We're going to learn about that next, next time. And, and we will reign with him. What an incredible dignity, friends. What an incredible privilege that is. And so we need to think of ourselves in terms of being a steward. When we think of ourselves independently from God, that's when our life goes wrong. See, you, you will never, <laughs> in, in the words of Paul, you will always serve someone or, or the other. You'll either serve sin or you'll serve righteousness. You'll either serve Satan or you'll serve the devil, uh, 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 God, I mean, sorry. And, and so that's the nature of the way that we've been created, to be a steward under God. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Don't think in terms of ownership. Amen? Think in terms of stewardship. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It's quite ironic that, you know, if we think of ourselves, ownership, getting me what I want, everything goes wrong, doesn't it? And we get frustrated, we get disappointed, we become depressed. But when we think, how can God be glorified in me? Everything seems to go right. And his blessing and favor and grace is upon us. Amen? Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Hallelujah. So, as I say, I want to keep saying this, being a steward is not a negative thing, it's a positive thing. In fact, the Bible says this, that we are sons of God, and if sons, we're heirs of God. Joint heirs with Christ. You know, God saves us, he brings us into his family, uh, he brings us around his table, we, he discusses his plans with us, he includes us, in what he is doing in the earth and he gives us positions of privilege and, and uh, a great opportunity for him. So it's not a negative thing. Now, when we think of stewardship, this has helped me, this little diagram here has helped me a lot. There are four stages of development in the life of a Christian as I see it. The first is to become a believer. Now, a believer, by definition, is a person who believes in Jesus for salvation. Okay? So that's the first stage. The second stage is a disciple. We don't get people serving as soon as they're saved. That's a tragic mistake, and many of us have fallen into that trap. Amen? First of all, we need to be established in what is the truth of the gospel. What is the true message? Hallelujah. What, it, what does it mean, like we've just been hearing about being in Christ and having Christ in you? What is your new creation identity? We need to be discipled in that. So a disciple is a person who doesn't go around around serving. He sits and listens and learns and he builds his life upon the teachings of Christ and the apostles. Amen? And then we come to this Third stage here, a servant is a person who uses his gifts and resources for the kingdom of God. Then some go on to become 
a leader. Oops, go back. A leader. And a leader is a person who accepts the responsibility for influencing the lives of others according to the will of God. And so this thing of, of stewardship is such as a, an important part of New Testament doctrine. Do you know that Jesus spoke 36 parables and 17, that's just over half of them, are to do with stewardship. Isn't that amazing? 17 out of 36. And then when you look through the epistles, you see that it's, it is a common theme. Our stewardship, we've seen some of the verses today. And what this parable shows us, this parable of the, uh, of the faithful steward shows us, is that God is sovereign in the way that he distributes his goods. He's not a communist. He's not everyone gets an equal share. Remember, they're his goods. He can do with what is his as he likes. And so to one was given one talent. To another was given two talents. To another was given five talents. And, uh, you know, what is a talent? We use that term today to mean a gift or an ability and, and of course it includes that. But actually a talent originally was a weight, a weight, and then it came to be used for weighing money or gold. And so a talent consisted of 6,000 denarius, or denarii, that's the plural. A denarius is one day's wage. So one talent was 6,000 days wages. So if you say there are 300 working days in a year, back then they worked six days a week, okay, uh, then they had holidays. So basically one talent was a year's salary. Oh, sorry, say that again. One talent was a, uh, one denarius was a day's salary. So 300 denarius was a year's salary, okay? So one talent was 20 years wages. So he gave to one man the equivalent of 20 years wages. To another man he gave two talents, the equivalent of 40 years wages. You with me? To another, five talents, the equivalent of a 100 years salary. And then he went away and the purpose of that was that they would, would trade with that. He gave them the ability to go and trade. Praise God. All given different amounts. Doesn't mean that one person was more important than the other. Doesn't mean that at all. That was not the message. But what it does mean is that to those who much have been, have been given, much will be required. Amen. So we've all received abilities. Now the second word in stewardship, in understanding stewardship, is the word responsibility. What is responsibility? Responsibility is my response to the ability that God has given to me. Amen? It's my response to the ability that has been entrusted to me. And remember, that's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing. It, it's, it, 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 there's a dignity with that. I'm absolutely blown away that God has included me in his plans, brought me into the, the management of his affairs. And, and so my response to that is to be faithful in the way that I respond to that. Now, the, the first two servants in our parable understood that very well. They went away. The Bible says they traded. I like that term. They traded. They, they used what they had so that it might grow, increase, and multiply. And that's what happened. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But there was one servant who buried his talent. What a strange thing to do. He went away, dug a hole, buried it, and kept it there till his master came back. Why do people do that sort of thing? Why do people bury the gifts or the abilities that God has entrusted to them. I've thought about that and, and looked at this parable and there, there were four reasons that I come up with. You might think of others. The first it's given to us here in the parable is fear. He said, I was afraid. 
See, when you've been given something to give to others, the fear is if I give away, then I'll become impoverished. Okay, if I've got money and I give you some, I'll have less. Now, if I give you some more, I'll have less still. <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I have time and I give it to you, I'll have less to do what I want to do. If I have uh, the power to forgive my enemies and I do that, they might take advantage of me. And so I'm fearful about giving away. But you know, it works the opposite way in the kingdom of God. This is the dynamics of the kingdom. Give, and what? It will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. It doesn't work in te terms of being impoverished. It works in terms of being empowered to do more. That's the principle of the cross. Jesus said, you know, his life was like a seed. If I hold that seed in my hand, I've still got it. You haven't got it, I've got it. It's still safe, but it's only gonna be one seed. You've let it fall into the ground and it will decompose and all of a sudden new life will spring forth and it will begin to grow and become very fruitful. That's the principle of the cross. And so the answer to fear is faith. The other stewards were called faithful. To be faithful is to be full of faith. I'm giving this away. I know it sounds crazy. I'm giving out, but actually I'm believing it's going to come back to me so that I can do more for God. Amen? So fear is one thing. Another thing is that causes people to bury their gift, and I've seen this you know, over my years as a pastor, is the desire to control. Let me, let me just turn this on myself. Okay, God has given me a gift of teaching. If I wanted to, I could use that to control. To say, if I don't get my way, I'm withdrawing my gift. And then you're in a pickle, aren't you? <laughs> See? And so I bury my gift. And I've got to an answer for that one day. God gave me something to give. It was, it was not mine. As a, to use as a bargaining chip. Amen? It was to bless the body of Christ. And incidentally, you wouldn't be in a pickle because God would bring somebody else along with a gift. That's why Jesus said, don't let somebody else take your crown from you. Amen? Amen? Okay, a third reason why people bury their gift is because of misunderstanding. We see that as well in this parable. What did this man say? I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you haven't sown, wanting what is unreasonable from what you've given to us. What a misunderstanding of the heart of God. I knew you to be a hard man. God is not like that. God is not like... You see, this man, why is it that this man hid his talent and not the other man? Probably because he had the least. And he, he watched the others, the man with two had grown his to another two. I could never do that with my one. He watched the man with five grow it to another five. Well, I've only got one. No way could I do that. God will never judge you by putting you alongside someone else and making a comparison out of you. Why don't you be like him? Sometimes we do that as parents, don't we? Why don't you be like your brother? <laughs> God will never do that. He's not a hard man. Don't misjudge him. Don't don't uh, put him into that category. I, I remember, you know, one lady wrote to me, um, and I, I think I included this in one of my books, and uh, she said, you know, I'm just under so, condemnation, uh, so much condemnation because people say to me, why don't you go out and evangelize and preach the gospel and do this and that? She said, but I'm a mother. I've got these children. I've got to look after these children. I said, that's your responsibility. That is yours. So God is not asking you to do what these are doing. God is asking you to be a good mother. You know, so many people have tried to save the world and lost their family. Be a good parent. Be, what has God entrusted to you? Look after them. Sow into them. Be faithful in ministering to them. Jesus said this, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. 
Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? We've done a lot of works. Yeah, your works. Your works. Then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. God is not a hard man. God empowers us to do what he wants us to do. Don't mind anyone else. Don't compare yourself with a five-talent or a two-talent person if you're a one-talent person. Amen? Just be faithful with what you have got. That's all God is asking you. Another reason why people bury their talent, and this comes out again in the parable, simply because they're lazy. <laughs> they're lazy. Jesus said that this master said to the servant, you're wicked and lazy servant. Many people just don't want to serve God. They don't want to live for God. They want to live for themselves. They want to live for this world. And so they put all their, their effort into, into what they want to do. Lazy concerning the kingdom of God. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, grace does not make us licensed loiterers. People who just lounge around, loiter around. I said, That's, that is a fallacy in understanding grace. Grace does not make you lazy. Amen? Paul said, I thank God that I worked harder than them all, all the other apostles, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Grace empowers us to do what we could never do in our own power and energy. It's done in the power of His grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah doesn't make us lazy. You know, some people say, well, well, grace, you know, there's a rest. We come in. Yes, there's a rest. That means we don't strive to make things happen. We know who we are in Christ. We rest in that. And then out of that comes an abundance of good works. I want to rest. I don't know about you. I, I love to rest. <laughs> I find myself being more phlegmatic as the years go on. I love to rest. But, you know, we've got an eternity to rest. We've got an eternity to rest. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labours and their works follow them. That's the day we will rest. We cease from our labours on this. But now is the, the day and the opportunity to, to do what we cannot do when we leave this life. Amen. That is to use our ability. Respond to God empowering us with his ability by being faithful in our administration. You know, one of the things that have really helped me in my ministry is the understanding that true success is just being faithful. True success is just being faithful. I used to think that I was responsible for results and try to manipulate and manufacture results. It's been a great release to me personally to realize that results are not my department. They belong to God. One sows, another waters, but God gives the increase. They, the increase comes from God in his time and in his way. Sometimes you don't know of the fruit that has come from your works. It's been hidden from you. You will know in eternity. But success is being faithful, which is to be full of faith in what God has given to you by his grace and moving forward in that. Amen? Amen. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ, said Paul, and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of a steward that one be found faithful. Hallelujah. I trust that that will encourage you too because it was a great encouragement to me. And so the first word of a steward is ability. God has given us abilities. The second word is responsibility. Our response to those abilities. The third word is accountability. We see at the end of the parable they were all called to give account. Friends, this is not a negative thing. Remember what this is all about. Jesus is now setting up his kingdom. And he's wanting to appoint faithful stewards in position of authority and responsibility. So he calls them to account. 
And we read, So he who had received the five talents came and bought five other talents, saying, Lord, you deliver to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Isn't that great? Jesus saying, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received the two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. He didn't say, well, you didn't do as well as him. No. God doesn't compare us with others. But he looks at our faithfulness. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Incidentally, you know in the Greek, this is a very, very vivid graphic expression. It, both those clauses start with the, the phrase five talents or two talents. It starts like this in the Greek. Five talents, Lord. Five talents you gave me. And then, look, five talents more. <laughs> he's just absolutely blown away at how this is multiplied just because he's been faithful. That's being surprised by grace. Grace always surprises. When, when we just give ourselves to God in his hands, we are blown away at what God can do through us. We've heard some great testimonies this morning. And friends, I want to commend you as a church. This church, first of all, this church has got faithful servants in every department of our church. We've got faithful ministers in their eldership, our deacons, those who serve in the responsibilities of, uh, on the rosters and so on. You know, other pastors, I, I don't know what it is. It must be the very roots of the message we preach but other pastors have to manipulate, have to constantly stir people up, wind them up, play tricks with them, put the carrot before them, get the whip out. <laughs> we, we never have to do that. People are motivated by, great, by the grace of God. Amen? Amen? It's wonderful, friends, I tell you. Makes our job easier. <laughs> what was I saying? <laughs> Accountability. Yes. Okay. And, 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 you know, we're surprised at what God can do with us if we give ourselves to him. Look at the testimonies that we've seen this morning and we know are taking place in Africa just because we've been faithful in what God has given us. People have criticized, criticized us. They've, they've opposed us for it. And uh, they've, they've challenged us over, over it. But we've just said, no, this is what God has given to us. We're going to keep doing what he's called us to do and leave the results to him. And uh, we too are surprised by grace. Hallelujah. Okay, we'll look at this one man who hid his talent. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap and I have not sown. In other words, you haven't even lived up to what you knew about me, what you thought you knew about me. If, if you really believed that, you would have got cracking. Uh, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. He'll use it. He'll be faithful with it. For to everyone who has, more will be given. But he who, uh, and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, this is not anything to do with salvation. That's not talking about hell. It's talking about being outside the kingdom rule. This great privilege that was given to that servant to, to share in the administration of Christ's kingdom has been taken from him. They're weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. But friends, what we need to understand is this, that there is coming this day of account for all of us. 
so then each of us shall give account of himself to God. It's called the judgment seat of Christ, where it's nothing to do with our sins. It's a place where Jesus wants to reward us, wants to reward us and give us positions of privilege and responsibility in his coming kingdom. Behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Amen? Amen. And so last week we saw the one word that characterized the good virgins, the five good virgins, was the word wise. The way they lived their lives was wise. They had oil in their lamp, their lamps were burning. The one word that characterizes a good steward, faithful. Whatever he has entrusted to you, be faithful. Be full of faith. Step forward. Move forward. Use that, what God has given to you. Leave the results to him. Don't become discouraged. Don't look at what you see with a natural eye, but trust God to give the increase. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for your precious word. We thank you, Lord, that you have counted us faithful, having given us such responsibilities. What a trust that is, Lord. What, what a dignity you put upon us, Lord. And we take that seriously, Lord. We, we're humbled by it. We thank you, Lord. You, you haven't even given the administration of this planet to angels, but you want us, Lord God, to succeed in that creation destiny that you had for us to have dominion with you over this planet. Father, we thank you for that. We are so humbled. We're so grateful. And we know that it's by your grace, Lord, and your grace alone that we can stand strong and be faithful unto you. So we give you the praise and the glory and the honor this day. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Praise God.